Welcome, everybody. We are here to discuss Paul's book. I will briefly introduce uh, the panel, and then I will um, turn to Paul to talk for about five minutes about the main messages of his book, and then the three of us will um, each respond for about three minutes, and then we'll have some discussion, and then we will uh, open this up for a general discussion. Karen Dornfried has done roughly everything you can do to be involved in transatlantic relations from a U.S. perspective. She's been the relevant national intelligence officer. She's been the relevant senior person at the National Security Council. She's been the relevant non-governmental actor as the head of the German Marshall Fund. She's been the relevant assistant secretary of state. She's been substantially honored both by the State Department and by a variety of European countries with whatever their local equivalent of a knighthood is. There's probably nobody better to comment on the transatlantic aspect of global accord or global discord. Steve Walt is a longtime professor here at uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School, the author of a number of uh, books, but along with uh, John Mearsheimer, is the principal exponent of what they would call a realism-based uh, approach to thinking about international relations that de-emphasizes certain aspects of morality, de-emphasizes certain aspects of the internal composition of uh, states, but comes to very clear, strong, vivid, and prescriptive conclusions on uh, many questions. He is not the coiner of the term, but there is no sharper critic of the set of communities of which Karen is a quintessential part um, <laughs> than <laughs> Steve's use of the term the blob uh, <laughs> to refer to the foreign policy establishment. We're here to celebrate um, Paul Tucker's and to discuss and argue with uh, Paul Tucker's uh, book, uh, Global Discord. I would just say this about uh, Paul. There are a fair number of people of whom I would be an example who have tried to do intellectual work, have done their best intellectual uh, work, and then with the benefit of their knowledge and their experience, have moved from uh, purely intellectual life to some kind of uh, policy life. There are many fewer people who have had a very policy life and been substantially influential in shaping the affairs of a nation and have then gone on to more academic pursuits, not having been involved professionally in those academic pursuits before going into uh, government. Other than Paul, the principal example I can think of of such a person is George Kennan who entered the Foreign Service at a young age, had enormous influence as a State Department official, left uh, the State Department and became an enormously influential diplomatic historian, including of events in which he played no role at all during his diplomatic uh, career. Paul has made the transition from consummate senior financial bureaucrat to political philosopher with extreme grace and uh, skill. This is his second major book written as a fellow here at the Kennedy School. It is entitled uh, Global Discord, and we certainly have plenty of that 
uh, right now. Paul, tell us about uh, your main conclusions. Larry, thank you very much and for those kind words. No one second career more possible, easier than you. And I am profoundly grateful for that. And I'm very grateful to Karen and Steve um, for the disagreements we're about to embark <laughs> on peaceful um, discord. Um, the most important thing for any political community, domestic, local, international, is order, safety, protection, degrees of trust, um, which together provide the conditions for any kind of cooperative enterprise at all, modest or ambitious. Any order relies on some complex mixture of power and norms. Without the norms, the power is used and abused and eventually faces um, resistance. The best way of thinking about the norms that constitute a political society are as legitimation norms. And I won't dwell on this, but this is at the center of the book and that it mapped two things about that matter enormously. One is, is that the legitimation norms that hold together a state can be at times in tension with the norms that hold together any kind of international community or society. The second, and I'll dwell more on this, is that if there are tectonic shifts in the makeup of power in the world, then the order itself um, can be put in jeopardy and that that throws everything, norms, practices, institutions, organizations into flux. And that of course is where we are given the rise, the extraordinary rise, which in many ways is to be celebrated the way it's lifted so many people out of poverty of the People's Republic of China. Many parallels are drawn between today's situation and episodes from the past. All of the examples I'm going to mention are illuminating. None, I think, is sufficiently illuminating. And that is because this is a struggle that is everywhere in everything is ideological and where very obviously neither side can knock out the other in any kind of easy way. So comparing it with the Cold War, the Cold War was not in everything because Stalin walked the Soviet bloc out of the main highways of international economic commerce. The People's Republic is absolutely central to the international economy today. And there's a vital point here that whereas international commerce, international trade is a non-zero sum game, security, big picture, is a zero sum game. And that presents kind of all kinds of problems and challenges in navigating this. You can think about the de-risking and the decoupling that's going on in trade, which I've been encouraging for more than half a decade as facing hazards of both overshooting, where we spiral away into a protectionist vortex, which would be ghastly, or undershooting, leaving us more vulnerable and leaving them more vulnerable um, than either side would wish. It's not exact. Today's conjuncture geopolitically isn't analogous to the struggle between my country and the Second German Reich at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries because fundamentally that was about power and not about ideology. And if you are not familiar with document nine, which was kind of released or leaked from the central committee of the Chinese Communist Party in 2013, one of the things you should do after this talk or even during it is <laughs> Google it. Um, this is something which we as a community are insufficiently familiar with. It is essentially an instruction, a very eloquent instruction to the Chinese people, not only not to promote, but not even to discuss and debate um, the merits and demerits of our political way of life. I think there is the closest I can think of in modernity to the today's contest is between France and Britain in the long um, 18th century from roughly 1689 
1815. And one, that was so long that there were periods of tranquility, even of modest cooperation. There was a trade pact agreed in the middle of the 18th century, then they fell into kind of war again, and that moment wasn't recaptured until, I think, the 1860s. And you can see what's going on today in the West Coast as the inevitable ebbing and flowing of tense relations, something that is going to be so protracted, in my view, will have moments of coming um, together. I want to say um, just two other things. Um, the world I'm describing will be hazardous for international organizations. Multilateral organizations like the WTO uh, are likely to be sclerotic in ways that are difficult to climb out of. Um, I think more or less the same is going to be true for the International Monetary Fund as well. I'll leave those thoughts just dangling. The second is that, um, and this is as much of what I say is symmetric between this capital, Washington and, and Beijing, is this is not a moment for silos in government, a product of over half a century of security is that silos are rampant um, naturally in the main capitals of the West, be that Washington, um, London, Berlin, um, Paris, to some extent, um, Brussels. I think we can already see that that is starting to shift. My goodness, it needs to. I think the book argues that an objective that a, a, a prudent policymaker um, will have in mind all of the time is to minimize the maximum costs of the bad states of the world that are plausible in the period ahead. I don't think the West, with its friends in East Asia, can possibly expect to contain the rise of China. I do think we can do um, three things. I think we can reduce and to some extent avoid unnecessary vulnerabilities through cross-border trade and investment and cultural exchanges and so on, where the hazard is overshooting. The second thing, and Washington hasn't always been good at this, is to maximize in every part of the world and to remember that in a superpower contest that every part of the world will matter. That if you, the unfortunate um, thing about the metaphor of pivoting is that you pivot to something and you but you impliedly pivot away from something, which is what people in Central Asia and the Middle East and well, when that metaphor um, was prominent. And the third thing is not to make mistakes and in particular not to make unnecessary mistakes at home. And it's in that context that we should be bothered about the levels of US debt it is that in that context that we should be bothered about how complacent Washington and European capitals are about banking crises. The last big banking crisis was an enormous boon um, for Beijing. Um, but most of all, um, we have to hold up together that if there is anything um, that symbolizes and actually more than symbolizes constitutes our way of life. It is peaceful transfers of power. And if yeah, in the next 12 months, we will find out whether we are capable of conducting politics in a way um, that enables us to maintain our way of life. This book is about hanging on to our way of political life. It is not about dominating China. It is not about trying to press either them or other parts of the world into our way of life. It is that our way of life is important for us and um, we need to understand that and not hand it away. Karen, want to react to all of that and to the broad topics that Paul has raised? Absolutely, but first I have to react to the introduction. We have not met before, and I thought, gosh, he's being so nice. I should have thought I was being set up to be called part of the blob. And I do know Steve, who's been so polite, never 
to say, Karen Glob Donfried, we're so glad you're here. And then when you went and compared Paul Tucker to George Cannon, I felt really bad. So I guess, you know, expectations are low. Uh, expectations should not be low about Paul Tucker's book, which I brought so you could all see how beautiful it is. And one of the really lovely things about being here at the Kennedy School is I get to read books, <laughs> which I really haven't done for a while. And, um, you know, I, I thought that of the many things I could say about Paul's book, I really found it thought provoking. And I mean that in the best sense of the word, so that you, you uh, get into his argument and it made me think about things in a different way. And there are various comments I have. I think I'm just going to focus on one and then we can we I'll weave in some of the others as, as we get into the discussion. But Paul gave a great sense of what he's trying to do in this book. The fundamental question that, Paul, I thought you were tackling, and it's so essential for this period of history, is how should democracies deal with illiberal states? And as Paul made clear, namely, he means the People's Republic of China in asking that question. How, do, how should democracies deal with the liberal states while upholding our own political and economic values? And you really couldn't have picked a better day for this, given that Presidents Biden and Xi are meeting in California. The solution, or at least a big part of the solution that Paul presents in the book is in favor of cooperation among liberal states and that those liberal states then can maintain distance from their liberal counterparts. And Paul develops this proposal about a world of concentric circles with deeper cooperation among states that share norms and values. So you have this core of deep, or he calls it thick cooperation among states that share those norms and values. And in so doing, you also wanna be mindful about reducing strategic dependence on others who have different values. And in many ways that fits what we see happening today. As I thought about it, and Paul, this was something I wanted to draw you out on. I thought about two of the key challenges we're facing today, and then I tried to apply this to those challenges. One of them is climate change. And what's interesting about trying to manage the climate crisis, it work to work only with that core of countries with which you have deep cooperation because you share values? Or is that problem so large that you need the broader international network to tackle that problem? And it was interesting to see our climate envoy, John Kerry, meet with his Chinese counterpart in the run-up to the bilateral meeting today in California to try to make progress on some of these issues. And we did see a Chinese-American agreement about stepping up cooperation on renewables. And so one question is, how do you manage that kind of a big problem while maximizing cooperation among like-minded states. And then the other challenge that came to my mind was technology. And on the one hand, you can see the merits of cooperation between the U.S. and China. And just, you know, as, as we were, many of us were no doubt reading the New York Times this morning, this article about the biden she meeting, and the article said, the two are likely to announce a new forum for a discussion of how to keep artificial intelligence programs away from nuclear command and control. So there are areas related to tech and AI where the US and the PRC have incentives to cooperate. But overwhelmingly, I would say a space of fierce competition. And so take competition around advanced chips. There's, I think, a broadly held view that whichever country wins the tech race will dominate the 21st century. So you see the United 
state now banning exports to China of advanced semiconductor designs and equipment. And we are working with key allies like the Netherlands, like Japan, to do the same. So, yes, you see that core concentric circle, the U.S. working with allies to try to ban this advanced technology and design from reaching China. But in so doing, are we actually working against, at odds with our values of economic liberalism and open international trade? And so that was the other piece I wanted to come back to you on, Paul. But let me stop with on that for now. So thanks. Steve? Great. So the first thing I wanted to say is I wish this book had existed when I was in graduate school um, because uh, my fellow graduate students and I would have sat around for hours arguing about it to our benefit. Um, it's really rare to see a book combine political theory and history and contemporary policy problems all in one package. And so I want to emphasize it's a genuinely impressive achievement. And the fact that it's being done by an amateur scholar is really uh, daunting. Um, He's George Kent. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very I, very say I went to Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will say a few words about the theoretical underpinnings of the book and then draw some depressing conclusions from them, and none of them will surprise Paul. Uh, so the theoretical argument in this book draws on three very profound thinkers, Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, and Bernard Williams. And to oversimplify wildly, Hobbes is all about power, Hume is about interests and norms, and Williams is all about legitimacy. All of these elements are important to create order. You need norms, and those norms have to be legitimate. But the key question is the relationship between them and which of them matters more. And I want to make the case that Hobbes is, in fact, the surer guide to our predicament. Uh, as you all know, Hobbes' central proposition is that without a central authority, we all live in fear of violent death. That's true of individuals in the state of nature. It's true of states in the international system. Uh, even if you're not at war today, you might be at war tomorrow. And that fear casts a shadow over everything states do, including the many acts of cooperation that take place between them. Hobbes also insists that our notions of right and wrong and legitimacy are heavily shaped by power. What he writes in Leviathan is, nor does it alter the case of honor, whether an action be just or unjust, for honor consisteth, consisteth only in the opinion of power. What he's saying here is those with power largely determine what's considered right and proper and therefore worthy of honor. All right, so what are the depressing implications? Well, states do need rules and norms and institutions to manage their relations, but these are tools that powerful states implement and enforce <laughs> largely in their own interest. It's the United States that creates the Western order after World War II, not Bolivia, not Portugal. Second, those with power will go to great lengths to convince everyone that those rules are broadly beneficial, whether they are or not. So when you hear President Biden or Secretary of State Blinken speak of the value of a rules-based order, that's what they're doing. But of course, if the rules no longer serve their interests, they'll revise them or ignore them. And as Paul said in his opening remarks, as the balance of power shifts, rising powers are gonna try and alter those rules to benefit themselves. And at the same time, convince everyone that altering the rules is really in everyone's best interest. This of course is what China has been doing. Last point, when states are fearful, and especially when the threats seem to be existential, they throw the rule book out the window and they do horrible things. And that's as true of democracies as it is of autocracies, in my view. Now, Paul is absolutely right, and the book is very good on this, in explaining that the, or the Western order has had important Humean and even Kantian characteristics. But this system emerged under the umbrella of American power, which protected the Western order from the Soviet Union, and very importantly, protected members of that order from each other in various ways. But notice something else. 
the United States in this period used its power against its adversaries with very little restraint, but we also played hardball with our closest allies within that concentric set of circles. We worked to dismantle the British system of imperial preference after World War II. We crashed the pound during the Suez crisis of 1956, and we blew up the Bretton Woods financial system in 1971, just to pick a couple of examples. Yet the system was broadly legitimate because there was really no alternative to American power. And the question I have for Paul is what's changed to the extent that this system is fraying now then what's, what's different? Um, now, last point, uh, what are, how are we uh, responding to the rise of China? We didn't put export controls on China and force our allies to go along with them because the Chinese Communist Party isn't respecting free speech or is persecuting the Uyghurs. We did it because we're worried about the long-term balance of power and we don't want China to surpass us. So if our friend Hobbes were using modern language, he would say this is the mother of all incentive incompatibilities. The United States and China cannot both be the most powerful state in the system and neither wants to be number two. Uh, now, my last question is the following. The book lays out four scenarios for the future, a lingering status quo, a superpower rivalry that's managed pretty well, a new Cold War or a reshaped order. You're agnostic in the book about which one to expect, but I would want to push you to say which is you think is most likely at, at this point. Hobbes would bet on number three, uh, a new Cold War where the United States compete and China compete across the board and push other states very hard to line up on one side or the other. And if we look at what's happening in the world today, including the meeting between Xi and Biden going on now, isn't that pretty much what we see competing across the board and trying to get as many others to line up on one side or the other? So I guess I would argue that Hobbes is winning the argument with Hume and Williams even if that means humanity is likely to be the loser. I'll stop there and I hope Paul can convince me I'm being too gloomy. Thank you. I'm just a um, humble economist and economists are That's people a contradiction who, in terms. who people know, economists are people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So I'm sort of, humbled and almost ready to be silenced by the intellectual power that I'm joining, but not quite uh, silenced. So I'm just going to pose a few things that this conversation makes me wonder about uh, directed uh, more at Paul. First, Paul, I hear myself when I go around and talk and meet people, thinking of the world as being very different today than I thought about it being three years ago. The combination of Russia's attack on Ukraine, the discovery that Putin and Xi had met twice as often over the previous decade as the president of the United States and the prime minister of England, the enduring alliance between Russia and China, the addition of Iran to that team, the events of October 7th caused me to think of the salience of major war risks in a very different way today than I did three years ago. And the way in which you spoke, which was about the rise of China, 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 big part of me, China's growing, more or less everything you said, you could have said three years ago. And so my first question is, was I just kind of a little naive and foolish three years ago, uh, which I think is probably what you think, or should people really think kind of differently about the world post-Ukraine war, post-October um, 7th uh, than uh, they did? The second question, maybe it's a kind of academic question, maybe it's a kind of a fundamental question, I'm not quite sure. You said something that is said all the time that strikes me as being just wrong, but it might well be that I'm just confused, and I, I mean it. 
You said economics is a positive sum game and security is a zero sum game. And I kind of have always thought of security as fundamentally being a positive sum game because you have if you have a war, it's terrible for both sides. And if you don't have a war, it's kind of OK for both sides. So there is win win is avoid a war. Lose lose is have a war. So it's kind of exactly the opposite of a zero sum game. So this idea that security is zero sum and economics is positive sum seems to me to miss the point of what people like Karen spend their lives on, which is having negotiations so as to avoid conflicts and so as to build norms and establish norms in which there aren't wars. So my instinct is you should just lose the sentence, security is a zero sum game, but I might be confused and somebody maybe may need to set me um, uh, set me straight. The third thing that I'd be interested in some reflecting on is what I would call the difference between the big and the small, the transcendent and uh, the minutia. I grew up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a famously provincial town, and there was a standard joke about Philadelphia, which was that there'd be a nuclear attack on New York, and the Philadelphia Inquirer's headline would be, atomic bomb hits Manhattan, 311 Philadelphians die. And it was intended to suggest that there was some lack of perspective. As I heard you pivot between what are the norms that are going to set the tone of the next century? And are we going to have good banking regulation to prevent financial crises over the next few years? On the one hand, I kind of admired enormously your versatility. On the other hand, I kind of wondered how they fit together. And I have the same view, and it's a it's a it's actually a deep question uh, in my mind. When I was in government, I was a spear carrier for lots of exercises that had the character of the G Biden meeting uh, today, Clinton Jiang Zemin meetings, Clinton Yeltsin meetings. I was a spear carrier for lots of such things. And the wording of the communique seemed immensely important to me when I was a spear carrier and whether we would or would not have a working group and whether it would be a working group or a task force mm -hmm. and when the working group or the task force would report seemed immensely important to me. I confess that since I've been a professor at Harvard, I've never actually Googled a communique from one of those meetings and read the actual words of uh, the communique. And the details seem vastly less important to me. And it's hard for me to kind of believe, you know, maybe we'll get it right with China over the next century, maybe we won't, but whether we have an AI task force or not, doesn't seem like it kind of matters very much relative to that. On the other hand, it is bit, by bit, and I'm reminded of one of my first experiences in uh, government. I was a new professor at Harvard. I was a new undersecretary of the treasury. I'd been a professor at Harvard for quite a while. And it was the beginning of 1993. And the G20, G7 had gathered to plan its stuff for its plan for supporting the former Soviet Union and Russia in particular. And there was a finance official and there was a foreign ministry official from each country. And we were all seated around a table. It was the first such thing in which I had participated. And I found the thing excruciating because everybody said the same thing. And I had said a bunch of things that seemed sensible to me. And people were saying the same thing and nobody was giving me credit. And I had the norms of the seminar room where 
it's really a boring seminar if everybody says the same thing. And if you're making the same point somebody else does, then you're considered this bad. So I was finding this thing just agony. And I was like raging. And then there was a coffee break and a man named Bob Fauver, who Karen may have encountered at some point, who was a 35 year veteran diplomat of the United States. I expressed a little bit of this to him. And he said, Larry, you're being an idiot. You're being a complete idiot. The fact that they're all saying the same thing, that's called consensus. And that's the objective. And the fact that they're all saying what you said and treating it as their own idea, that's called successful US leadership. And this is actually exactly what we would like to have happening here. And it's really of no consequence at all that it's boring for you. No consequence at all. And that Churchill said, much better jaw jaw than bang bang. And we're having jaw jaw now. And so either go back to Harvard or get a life and grow up. And he wasn't he was slightly more polite about that. But I, the only thing that can be said for me is that I understood that I'd been a fool and took the lessons away. But say something about the relevance of all the regular little <laughs> minutiae stuff about yeah. the task forces and the working groups versus this high, like, are we going to have a Kantian world or a Humean world or a Hobbesian That's world uh, kind of stuff? Those are my three. Those are my, those are my questions. Do you want to respond to all of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Including, I mean, yeah. not just yes, mine. Yes, 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 yes. I, I'm, I'm going to start with your thing about communiques as a way of backing into Karen's and then coming to the Olympian heights. So there is one communique that's come out over the last 12 months that I would recommend you read. And like you, I do not spend, I spend a minute amount of my time um, reading communiques. And that's the communique of the Quad meeting earlier this year. This is United States, India, Japan, and Australia. So one way of thinking about the Quad is that the most important event in 2020 was not COVID, and I say that not lightly. I had COVID pretty damn badly, um, but actually the border skirmish between China and India. And a consequence of that, perhaps the most important consequence, was that Prime Minister Modi, and I'm going to put this in rather English terms, um, said, you know that idea that I thought was terrible, the quad? Actually, it turns out to be a good idea after all, the Quad was initially um, an initiative of Prime Minister Abe of Japan in his first term before he fell ill and had to resign. And India had been more than lukewarm um, about it. And Modi enabled um, Washington and others to revive it after that border skirmish. And I was amazed when I looked at the communique of the Quad because it has spawned all sorts of mid-level working groups in all sorts of fields across government. And what that does is it brings people um, together. Because at the second meeting you went to as an undersecretary, maybe what the official civil servant would have said to you, and actually the coffee breaks are important too, because um, you can get to know people and do things. There is... I'm not going to say what because it would be too boring. There is a moment in the financial crisis towards 2007 where there was a global initiative that came out of the vice chair of the Federal Reserve and I talking to each other in a long walk to a dinner. And it was a conversation that could only possibly have happened between people that knew each other um, reasonably well and could be candid about their local circumstances. And I do think in that sense that international organizations, even if their policy outputs decline, that they are um, important places where people can meet. Staying with you, Larry, I mean, actually three years ago, I do think you were um, wrong. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have written this book in a way, which I guess I started about five years ago and first spoke about in London in something called the Tacitus Lecture in, I think, 2016. But I also think you're right in an important sense and that something being possible, and I thought it was, I had a kind of 10% probability on serious conflict 
is different from it actually that possibility probability crystallizing and so the fact that there has been conflict and major conflict in two um, parts of the world um, is important. And in the first week after October the 7th, I thought that um, the Chinese foreign minister speaking to Saudi Arabia was incredibly important. And I thought that the statement by Prime Minister Modi, um, very strongly supporting Israel, was incredibly important, particularly given the kind of slightly complicated and varying history of Indian um, Israel um, um, relations. The, 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 the way of coming to Karen's questions is some other actors have kind of remained silent so far. You know, this is, this is not um, Beijing and Washington. One of the most profound things that I think is happening in the world is the rise of India and prospectively Indonesia. I thought that for a very long time. I mean, it's the first lines of the book uh, somebody walking into my office when I was, I think, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and saying to me, the Federal Reserve have just refused India a swap line. It doesn't matter what iota, what a swap line is. It was just something that India wanted to help them navigate the crisis. And my response was, don't they understand India is going to be a power? And I thought the decision was kind of above the pay, pay grade of my tribe of central bankers. And that that was, I think, 2009. Actually, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction than I thought, because I think when Steve gives the example of a Hobbesian world um, after the Second World War, everything is shaped in America's image. I think, I think that can be told as a Hobbesian story. I think it is much harder to tell the story after the Napoleonic Wars and the concert of Europe and Castle Ray and Metternich and the others as a purely Hobbesian story with a Leviathan um, on top. I mean, one of the most important things that happens in that period is Castle Ray in Britain um, responding to Metternich, you know, in some ways the greatest statement, statesman of the age, saying, no, no, we're not buying into your absolutist monarchist thing. We don't need to do that. We need to find norms that actually we share in order to preserve um, um, peace. And I think I say that because we're going into a period where I think it isn't um, um, United States versus um, the People's Republic, nor is it the United States and its friends versus the People's Republic and its friends, but that as the decades pass, it will increasingly be in a context where others if they manage to grow at a fairly rapid pace for a number of years, will also be serious actors um, on the international the point, stage. I'm sorry, you, you clarif clarify for me, you're saying something now which seems quite different from what you said when you, intro when you introduced this, you framed the rise of China versus the United States as the sort of defining existential challenge, which was gonna, and how they formed allies and how it all worked as what was gonna shape the next century. And now you, you just fell back into, it's all gonna be kind of like the post-Napoleon post century before World War I, where there are a bunch of countries and they're all going to be rising and growing and struggling with each other and how it's all going to work out. And the, and the those are two quite different visions. How do you, how do you reconcile those? How the, the reconciliation is that we're not yet after 1815. We are, we are, we are still at the, at the point. We, it is best to think of where we are right now and the risks of where we are right now um, as, as something that could result in severe conflict between two great powers. Um, and this is where the zero sum game comes in. I think that in when the stakes aren't this high, um, I think you're right that peace is a positive sum game. When the stakes are global leadership, um, no bargain can have a great chance of holding because the, because the, 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 the returns from reneging and prevailing are just absolutely 
enormous. But I think as the decades pass, the nature of the underlying game will change and become more like the 19th century, whether or not there has been a decisive um, conflict. Can we agree on the, can we agree on the formulation which may be somewhere between what you and I said, which is that global leadership is by its nature a zero sum game because there can only be one leader. Global security is by its nature a positive sum game because it either is secure, which is positive, or it isn't secure, which is negative for both sides. And so one should, and then one can debate the relative importance of leadership versus security. Is that a way of, is that a way of reconciling these ideas of positive sum and zero sum? Conversation, because I'm not sure that leadership is, is binary in the sense that either they lead or we um, lead. But let me just touch quickly on what sure. Karen Sorry. said. Um, I think what you say about climate change is incredibly important. And I include in my outer circle, um, trying to cooperate, I'm underlying trying on existential threats, which plainly include um, um, climate change. But I think actually that will face formidable obstacles, a kind of slightly cheap way I put it somewhere in the book, is that if you're sitting in Beijing, um, the unit of account in thinking about the costs of combating climate, climate climate change is the cost of an aircraft carrier. If you start off with fewer aircraft carriers than the um, um, United States, I think it would be very strange for the most senior levels of the Chinese leadership when presented with the costs of combating climate change, not to ask the question or actually people not to volunteer the answer. This is N aircraft carriers. Um, and that's a kind of cheap way of saying I mean, I think this will be like France, Britain in the 18th century. I think there will be moments when there are moments of possibility that might be secured, but then afterwards, who knows how long afterwards, there'll be moments when they think, actually, um, we may have given something away in a game that we care about even more than the effects of climate change, if they believe that they can control um, the migratory costs of climate change. I think technology is completely different. I mean, I think that that, the, 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 I mean, I think broadly speaking, the United States and its allies and friends as doing the right kind of thing, but with the hazard of overshooting and pushing us. I think this, this, this risk has receded for the time being, but I think there's a hazard of overshooting and pushing the world into protectionism. And that will play out in domestic politics in various ways. Politicians will find themselves doing things that they don't really want to do because they're stuck in some kind of domestic political um, tunnel. Um, and actually, I think the priority for that is to avoid cross-border trade and investment that weakens the security position in some material way. And there's no formula for this. This involves judgments. Let me give you an example. So I, I don't know whether it still has a vast factory in China, but I think Apple certainly has had a vast factory in China. Now imagine that during some incredibly tense situation, China cuts that off. A question that the administration of this country will need to answer in those circumstances and therefore needs to answer contingently before, is that grotesquely inconvenient for the United States and the West because people won't be able to get their parts for their iPhones or something? Or is that, or, but not more than grotesquely inconvenient with a very angry public? Or is it actually a threat to the United States position in the world? And I, I think the administration, each administration in the coming decades needs to go through almost everything of that kind, um, answering those kinds of questions and, and more. And that will be a very difficult thing um, to do. My answer to Steve, I think, of course, the, the one line answer is I think Hume does everything that Hobbes does, but slightly better with the benefit of another 
um, hundred years, and also the benefits of peace rather than writing under the in the shadow um, of of war. But I kind of started off with that as well. I yeah. think I think that human sense can make sense of some um, parts of history um, better than Hobbes can. But on your other question, which of the scenarios do I think is most likely to prevail? I think when it comes to international monetary affairs, I do think we're in a lingering status quo where the dollar remains the dominant currency and is likely to do so in some Otherwise, I think we are going to be in a superpower struggle tending towards Cold War because I think the dynamic of the game in a technical um, sense will be to kind of overshoot and withdraw that what people regard as safe territory for, for commerce in the broader sense is likely to become smaller and smaller. And the first question I asked you about the legitimacy of the US centric order. I mean, one could have argued it was really fraying under Trump that there was a brief resurgence under Biden. who we went to great lengths to try and repair it in certain respects. But my sense is it's still in a more delicate condition than it was 10 years or so ago yes. on a whole series of reasons. Partly, partly to kind of bridge from that to the practical, yeah. think ahead to the election next year, where I come from, by which I mean Europe, this is a rich enough part of the world to be a hard power again, if it could be politically unified to do so. This presents a dilemma. If this country absolutely falls apart, it will wish that it started moving towards political union and becoming a hard power quite, quite a while ago. But so long as there is a realistic prospect of this country remaining kind of stable and liberal in the European sense and the major power, people in Europe will not want there to be another great hard power in the world um, themselves. And that, I think, you know, we will see, I think, if, if this country is in a very bad place in what, 15, 16 months' time, I think the response in Europe will be um, very difficult and, and very important. If you'll permit me a question for Steve, sure. just on the principle that if I'm confused by it, I might not be the, I might not be the only one. Um, and it's just really, it, this yeah. may sound polemical, but I really mean it because I'm yeah. curious. You've been very powerful in your writings, like the ones I referred to that use the term blob, sort of down on a foreign policy versus uh, U.S. establishment that kind of likes talking about the U.S. as an indispensable nation and the liberal based order and the U.S. is indispensable and we need to do all this stuff. You've been very powerful in kind of writing and talking about that over the years. But when I heard your intervention, and even when I heard what you just said just now, it kind of sounded like, even though you, like you thought we might be messing up with Trump and all that, but you sort of sounded like we had a pretty good ride of it when the U.S. confronted its adversaries and coerced its allies and maintained order, and it was all pretty good. And now you seem to be, but you kind of have tended to, talk about the excessive ambition and excessive this and excessive that of the people who've been most enthusiastic about that. So I'm sort of a little confused about how you see what a rational hegemon should do. Yeah. So uh, maybe two, three points, and then I'll try to resolve the problem on positive sum versus zero sum on security, um, if you're confused there too. So I would draw a pretty sharp distinction between uh, American global leadership 1945 to roughly 1992 uh, in the Cold War, where the United States, with some others, created, managed uh, a Western liberal order reasonably well and ultimately won the Cold War without blowing up the world, which was a good thing. Uh, most of my criticisms and you know, books I've written about it begin with 92 and the unipolar moment and what we did with that, when we basically tried to take that concentric circle of a Western liberal order and make it a global liberal yeah. order in a yeah. variety of different ways. And if you look at the track record of that, you see a record of what I regard as a series of repeated failures and precious little learning from those failures. So we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. That's my criticism of the establishment as well. And we heard a little bit of it actually in your remarks um, when you said, you know, the problem in the United States is why you can't use the word pivot. 
Because if you pivot towards something, you're pivoting away from something. Well, that's almost like saying the United States is unable to reallocate its strategic resources or attention towards areas that might need more attention and let other areas deal with their own security problems themselves. I think, right? I think that at this point, I think there's a lack of realism in where you are, that if the United States is to prevail as the hegemon, I think it is harder to do that than you think. That, that may be, but my guess, my point is, I don't think the United States can try to lead and manage security orders in Asia, in the Middle East, and in Europe simultaneously. That's what we're trying to do right now. And my argument is not going very well. It's probably going best in Asia at the moment, if you've got a war in Ukraine and trouble in the Middle East. But the question is, how do you allocate amongst all of those? And what you're basically saying is the United States has to do almost everything everywhere. And that, I think, has gotten us into trouble. On the security question, I agree with you. Global security is a positive sum game, but creating arrangements that make all countries more secure simultaneously is hard to do. National security tends to be a zero-sum game. Things that make me more secure often make you less secure. I buy a couple more aircraft carriers, that makes you potentially more vulnerable. You have to go and buy three aircraft carriers. I feel threatened. And that's the way at least security people talk about it as a zero sum problem. What makes country A more secure tends to make country B feel less secure. So if I had to summarize that, diplomacy is a positive sum game. Defense defense budgeting is a zero sum game. Yeah. Would be a would be a summary of would be a summary of what you just said. Okay. We are this time has flown by because some of them, some of us like me have been abusive of the time limit and others like the other three on this panel have been fascinating. So we have a bit of a problem that we were going to go for an hour, but I'm going to suspend that and deem us to go for another 15 minutes. Those with and, power change the rules. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my power to say, we're going to go till, we're going to go till 415 and I'm going to open this for comments and questions and I'm going to take a number of them and then I'm going to ask people to take notes and I'm going to give everybody a chance to say something. Chris. There are people watching this on a Zoom, I'm told. So welcome to the people who are watching this on a Zoom. And if you want to send a question, um, you probably can't. Um, <laughs> given, given the time available, it's probably realistic. Chris, Chris Anstey with, uh, with Bloomberg News. Uh, so uh, one question is uh, about uh, the extent to which uh, panelists think that uh, the U.S.-China competition could be uh, a positive force in an economic sense. Uh, you know, a major uh, feature of the first Cold War uh, was uh, the U.S. and the uh, Soviets uh, competing in places like Africa uh, and Latin America in the form of proxy wars, sponsorship of nasty regimes uh, that locked up parts of their middle, uh, middle classes and so on. Uh, but what we're seeing now is competition to provide infrastructure funding, uh, to provide uh, you know, ports, uh, and uh, you see the G7 coming up with its own Belt and Road. Uh, you see uh, the German chancellor making three trips to Africa the past uh, couple of years uh, to build out supply chains. Uh, we also see the U.S. investing in R&D, uh, in uh, semiconductors, uh, in uh, clean energy in ways that it didn't under the, uh, under the impetus of China competition. Uh, given that, uh, you know, the past uh, 10, 15 years has been characterized by what someone in this room termed st secular stagnation. Uh, could we see an impetus here that helps overcome that? Okay. Yes, and back and then in the third row. Yeah, thank you for, for being here. My, my question is both to uh, Paul and, and Steve. It sounded to me that if the uh, global security is positive sum game and national security is zero sum game, the two contradict with each other. 
And does that mean that a war between U.S. and China is unavoidable? And how would small states, and in my situation, like for example, like Taiwan, deal with when two superpower uh, entangle with each other? Um, it, it does that mean that small states, uh, according to a realism, uh, don't have a choice but kind of to fall on onto the uh, uh, victims of the superpower competition? Thank you. I've not read the book. However, I do recall in an article that uh, Professor Walt wrote last year, How to Build a Better Order with Danny Roderick. And I'm curious if there's actually if that actually serves as a point of common ground yes. with the idea of concentric circles and uh, uh, multilateralism, uh, international cooperation. So uh, as much as the two of you may have uh, sparred a bit at the beginning, I'm really wondering if there is really uh, so much of a difference uh, and instead there's actually commonality. Yes. The discussions about us being a hegemon or potential hegemon, is that even realistic anymore? To be one, you have to have capacity and will with 34 trillion of debt, we don't have the capacity and the will, our ability to take casualties in any sort of war in the last 50 years has been almost nil. So the question is, can we really be a hegemon with neither the capacity nor the will? Are there other questions or, uh, or comments? Yes. Given, uh, given the presence of nuclear arms now uh, and the mutual assured destruction, uh, the wars of like the 19th century that you were talking about seem um, less likely to occur. Do you see a new playing field where third world war or a conflict between the US and China, do you see a new kind of warfare that we haven't seen yet? And what would that be? Like, what, how do you see that conflict playing out if it's not through conventional warfare? John? So I find it interesting that as you're, you know, we're a center for business and government, right? And as you go through this discussion, you talk about nation states, you talk about nation states in the form of sovereignty, um, you talk about uh, those kind of actions. Um, you haven't talked about the role of companies, the role of firms, when some of those firms are larger than most nation states. Yeah. Um, and then when you put that into a globalized economic system, information flows that, you know, basically are truly globalized, what's the role of these different stakeholders in thinking about how you get this, um, a combination of economic statecraft and global stability uh, and other kinds of considerations? So things you and I have. Yes. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, a quick question on protectionism. You mentioned, Paul, um, that you envision a potentially a world in which we diminish the risk um, through trade, but avoid a spiraling protectionism, uh, spiral into protectionism. Can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how we avoid that spiral? Let me suggest, uh this is a, as a way to proceed if nobody objects. Why don't we let the four of us speak in the opposite order with which we initially spoke? That will give Paul the last, that will give Paul the last word. So I'll say a couple of things, uh, then Steve, uh, then Karen, um, and then Paul gets uh, the last words, if that's a reasonable uh, way to proceed. I'm gonna say three things. The first is, this conversation should really make us all appreciate where we are. Stuff about castlery and the British 18th century and all that and understanding it really is important for thinking about whether there's going to be war or peace. 
And there aren't a lot of institutions in the world where those kinds of conversations are taking place and they're really important uh, to have. So we should all feel fortunate to get to be part, at least in my view, of uh, seminars like this one and thankful to people with extensive practical experience like Paul, who could be putting it to work for some bank um, at substantially greater compensation for uh, instead doing the kind of work that goes into a book uh, like this. Second, I think there is a a word that was touched on that came to mind as I heard the last question, but I think is very important that I'd be interested in others' reflection on, which I would put as cosmopolitanism. The world is very different in the degree of connection that takes place between people in different countries than it ever has than it ever has been uh, before. Uh, it wasn't that many years ago when I kind of thought of it as an event to place an international phone call. It wasn't that long ago that people hardly ever, the number of Americans who have a passport is 10 times as large as it was in the 1980s. So yeah, there's going to be deglobalization and stuff, but in terms of the extent to which people think of the world, as a place that is connected. It is something that has changed in a fundamental way and barring something really dramatic is gonna stay very different than it was when people like me started our careers. And I guess I'm interested in the thoughts of others about the extent to which uh, that uh, does an, uh, does and does not matter. I'm going to put anybody who's willing to accept being put on the spot um, as um, uh, a, a question because to kind of make a little bit of this a bit more concrete uh, than it's been. Let's define a major war as a war in which, and you'll see there's a kind of bias in the way I'm framing this question, but I'm going to define a major war as being a war in which a quarter million people from industrialized countries die. So by that standard, World War I was a world was a major war 20 times over. World War II was a major war 20 times uh over Korea was not a major war. Uh, Vietnam was not a major war by that standard. Any kind of war between the United States and China in which bombs dropped on each other's countries would almost certainly be a major war. When people start talking about risks of major war, I'm curious, uh, what, what do people think the probability of a major war is in the next generation. And I'm not looking for a precise number, but sort of, is it a number like 1%? Is it a number like 20%? Is it a number like 50% or more? I think, and how has your view changed? I think that's an important question in getting a sense of how we think about uh, all of these things. And I'd be interested in hearing any views that anybody's willing to express on, uh, on that question. I think I'm next on the, on you're, the list. You're next. Uh, it's slightly put on the spot by my yeah, last question. No, I'll, 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 this is where, whenever we do this exercise, we're all just pulling uh, numbers or probabilities out of thin air. But I'll say, uh, given your definition of a major war, I would say the probability of in the next generation, so the next 25 years or so, I'd put it maybe one in 10. Yes, uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere around there. Not real likely, but likely enough that it ought to worry you and likely enough that uh, we ought to be working to drive that probability down. Uh, I, I wanted to take a swing at some of the questions that were asked by, by the audience. Um, 
This very interesting question, would the uh, new competition have ancillary benefits in other realms uh, in some of the ways the Cold War did? Uh, yeah, I think that could happen, but I'll just say this is a pretty and risky way to go about doing things <laughs> that ought to be done in their own right. If, in other words, if we ought to have better infrastructure in the developing world, we ought to have better infrastructure, not because we're doing it as part of a competition with other, other countries. Um, uh, apropos Larry's uh, question, is war unavoidable? I never think war is unavoidable till sort of the moment that somebody says, okay, let's, let's go. There's always agency there. Um, uh, the paper I wrote with Danny Roderick uh, was brought up. I'll just say uh, it was fascinating collaborating with an economist. Uh, they see the world fundamentally differently. You are, you're labeled the dismal science, but my science is even more dismal. And, and economists do tend to see the world, I think, very much in positive some terms looking for ways uh, to, to generate benefits. And I'm more skeptical of that, as I already, already said. Uh, the United States cannot be a global hegemon. It can remain, I think, a regional uh, hegemon and very, very important. Uh, I will defer to Larry and Paul as to whether or not the United States can deal with debt problems. I personally think we can, uh, in part by following some of Larry's advice about the Internal Revenue Service. Um, but as for the casualty issues, are, are Americans reluctant to lose people in war? I don't think that's true. The problem is we haven't fought a war that was truly existential since maybe World War II. Right. So these have been wars of choice for the most part, and the willingness to sacrifice large numbers of people in a war of choice is always lower. Nonetheless, you know, 40,000 in Korea and 56,000 in Vietnam is not a trivially small number as well. Um, uh, I guess uh, uh, John's final point about uh, uh, companies, um, uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I did have a debate with my friend Ian Bremer a couple of years ago when he wrote an article about the technopolar world arguing that these big tech companies were kind of like like nation states now and this was changing the architecture of global politics and i thought that was wrong you can read his foreign affairs article and then you can read my response in foreign policy and decide what you think i think companies still exist within a political environment that is largely set by states they ultimately have to adapt no one is going to go to war to defend Tesla. Uh, no Tesla employee is going to be willing to sacrifice their life for their company the way that a Ukrainian might be willing to sacrifice his or her life for the independence of Ukraine. And that's a fundamental difference between companies and countries. Well, when Larry extended the timetable, Steve uh, chipped in. This is a demonstration of the effects of, of power. One way of summing up the debate between Hobbes and Hume is um, Larry just made an utterance. You were the audience and you sat there. You were the disposers in those circumstances. But this is an insight that I think Hobbes or Hobbesians kind of risk uh, missing. Actually, my number is the same as Steve in response to your question, and it's in the book somewhere. I would say, you know, these, it is very subjective and there's a question about what subjective probabilities are, but around 10% over the next generation. Also, I would say um, I would make three sub remarks on that. I mean, to the extent that there is a debate about whether we're in the Thucydides trap of the inevitability of war, it's worth holding on to the thought that although Thucydides starts off implying that it's inevitable between Sparta and Athens, actually the book is full of the contingencies of, of what actually brings them into conflict. It is not a book that demonstrates the uh, inevitably, inevitability of war. I would, I would make two other comments about war. One is a striking um, feature of this country, the most powerful military country in the world, compared with, say, mine, when my country was very powerful, is that a much smaller proportion of the, of the ruling American elite has has children or relatives serving in the military than was the case. And I actually think that is a source of weakness in domestic politics and international politics. And my last jab at my good friend, Steve, who we had debates about this while I was writing the book, is 
your Hobbes isn't a black box, but it, it can sometimes be, and then the states went to war. Well, people have to be prepared to go and, and fight. And that is something about the legitimacy of the state, that they think it's something worth um, fighting for. So all of these roads lead, I think, to questions about domestic politics and domestic legitimacy. Um, that bridges to the question from, um, from Bloomberg about, um, is there some good that's gonna come out of this in technological um, development, which I'll come to in just a second. And I think we already have the first proxy war. I think of, of, of Ukraine as a proxy war in the sense that Putin would not have been able to prosecute it um, as long as he has, or even embarked on it in quite the way he did without the acquiescence of Beijing. And we have probably learned more about that um, as time has passed. In fact, a change I made at the proof stage of this book was that I had thought Putin wouldn't make his move um, against Ukraine until and unless she or she successors made a move against um, Taiwan, because I thought the optimal thing for them to do together was stretch the United States. And even if big picture Steve is right that the United States can't be stretched everywhere, it's kind of more on top of that than um, it was, including more on top of it psychologically. Um, I, think, I think you're absolutely right about the technological race that this will promote. I do, in, and I think that is like the old Cold War. What I think is very different from the old Cold War is what I said earlier, is that was technology meets security and it wasn't kind of polluted um, with, with kind of comma, a huge amount of commerce between the two blocks. This is completely um, different. And on protectionism, um, I, I can't answer your question. I think this really, I think that, that we are at a moment in history where we need a higher quality of leadership in all of our capitals than we have needed for generations. And big picture over the past 20 years or so, we've probably had lower quality leadership than we have had um, for some generations. And I think that too is a way of framing the pressures um, on domestic politics. My response to John, for what it's worth, is that I think very few leaders of multinational corporations have their head round um, the world in which we are now in. I am not going to name the company. Um, this will feature in the preface to the paperback of the book, which comes out in the spring, and I don't name the company there, but the leader of a massive manufacturing company um, was reported in the Financial Times um, a few months ago saying breaking, decoupling from China is unthinkable for us. And my, my immediate response was, oh my goodness, does that mean it is thinkable for you to decouple from the United States or does it just mean you haven't thought about it very much? And actually, it means you haven't thought about it very much, or you have thought about it very much, and you haven't got on top of how to convey this in public. Because I can imagine the conversations, did you see what they said? Hmm, what do you think about them in general? Uh, meaning the, the person. And I think that multinational corporations are way behind in thinking about this. And on the whole, think about Merck in the run-up to, to the First World War a German company with a massive operation here. I know this because it's middle standard. I know one of the families a little um, bit. It was split in two. It wasn't put back together between the First World War and the Second World War, and it is still separate. Things happen to um, multinational companies in, in tense times. For what it, on Dani's paper with Steve, I, I think that there is, I think you're absolutely right. I think there is a good deal of overlap. If anything though, and this kind of slightly leans against the tone this afternoon, I, th I, I, I think that Danny and Steve make their, their kind of vision sound easier than I think it will be. In some senses, I am the, the kind of greater pessimist um, between us. Was there anything 
else. I think that's um, it. And actually, going back to where I 